Welcome back to the show. My guest today is Carrie Balcom from American Grass-Fed Association. Uh, so before we begin, if you can give yourself a quick introduction, Carrie. Sure. And just to clarify, it's Balcom, not Balcom. Oh, okay. It's like Balcom. Oh, okay. Always it's like pronouncing people's names is always the <laughs> toughest part for me in the beginning, you know? It's like, it's, it's like Baldwin. It's like Baldwin. So. Yeah, I see. Gotcha. I even went on YouTube to see the pronunciation, but they gave me the wrong one. So, <laughs> anyway, all right, but I got it this time. So the introduction is that uh, I've been with the American Grass Association since day one. We started in 2003 in response to what the USDA was going to allow on the label claim for grass fed that you could feed 20% grain, give antibiotics, hormones, and confine feeding operations uh, and feed them. Uh, so we, we formed as a trade organization in 2003. Um, to represent people who were actually doing grass-fed and to work on, with the government or try to work with the government on getting a, a, a good label definition. And when that didn't happen, we started our own third-party certified program. Uh, so we have been around for 16, 17 years now and going great guns. We have standards for ruminants, which is beef, bison, goat, and lamb. We have standards for grass-fed dairy. Um, and we have standards for um, pork, pastured pork now. And the nice thing about our standards is if you see our label on a package, it means that the animal, excuse me, has been born and raised and harvested in the United States, which is not true with a lot of labels out there. Gotcha. So when you go, when like a typical consumer goes to the grocery store and they see the phrase grass fed on, for instance, beef products, isn't it true that like most cattle are, or like all cattle are grass fed initially anyways? All animals, all grass-fed animals start out on pasture, and that's, that's true, that they are, when they are weaned, when calves are weaned, then they're sent off to feedlots and finished on grain, if some kind of feeding operation where they're finished on grain, which is not something they're, they're designed to eat. They're designed to eat forage uh, and turn that wonderful grass, which we can't digest, into energy, and that's what they, and they have a, it's a, it's a little complicated subject, but um, they turn grass into energy. So, and we can't do that. So they are, they are a plant-based protein. And how long are they typically with the feedlot operation model? How long are they typically on pasture before they're like months wise before they're transitioned over to a feedlot? Well, again, it depends on when you wean the animals, when they're ready to go, but usually weaning happens. Uh, oh, it, it depends on the operation. It depends on how they're set up. It's, it could be eight months. It could be 10 months, somewhere in there. Somewhere around a year. And how long is the typical like har harvesting cycle for kind of like feedlot, uh, feedlot cows or cattle? Well, those animals are kept in feed yards, depending on on their rate of gain, uh, anywhere between sixteen and eighteen months for for um, harvested animals off grain. But these again, these are these are just guidelines. It's not to say that's exactly what happens. Gotcha. So a lot of times, like, for instance, if I were to go to a grocery store and I see that phrase grass fed on, on the packaging label, does that automatically indicate that it's like 100% grass fed? Or does it indicate that obviously they were grass fed for, let's say, one year out of the two years of their life, but then they're kind of finished in a, in a feedlot? The, uh, the labeling issue is very, um, it's a big issue right now because the USDA... Um, is allowing some grass-fed label claims out there, and the animals have never seen grass or in a pasture. Um, the USDA's grass-fed label claim, it's all done by affidavit. They never see the farm. They're relying on people to submit paperwork that shows what they're doing. And um, we're getting, a, we're, we're filing a lot of uh, Freedom of Information Act to find out where these, these animals and how these animals are being raised. Um, so at this point, no, that doesn't mean that those animals have been on pasture their entire lives. Gotcha. But how about in terms of uh, the actual like species specific diet in terms of them being fed grass? So when you do see kind of like the grass fed phrase, does that indicate like um, pretty much they're 100 percent grass fed or they're just grass fed for a certain portion of their life, their life? Again, um, it could mean that they they're supposed to have not been fed grain. And again, I go back to the, to the, the statement that it's all done by paperwork. So there's, there's no way to tell. Now you can, um, supposedly they're supposed to be working on that. And they, they do use a definition that was uh, put in, 
put into the marketplace for many years by the Agricultural Marketing Service um, that said that they had to have a 100% forage-based diet. It didn't address antibiotics, hormones, or confinement, so those animals could have been fed our, uh, forage in, in, in confinement. But in about 2015-16, when some of the big corporations decided that they wanted to use a grass-fed label, USDA said, well, we can't, we don't have the authority to, to regulate this, so we're not going to use that definition anymore. So it's, it's a wild, wild west out there, my friend. <laughs> so it, it gets tough. Well, how about when you see like the grass-fed and grass-finished label on there? Is that kind of like regulated or does that mean anything? That, that means nothing. And grass finish doesn't have any legal definition and it could mean almost anything. Um, mm -hmm. They can take animals out of any kind of operation, put them on grass for a couple of years, a couple of days or weeks or months and call it grass finished. So mm -hmm. we try and stay away from that term because it, it, if it's grass fed, it's grass fed, it's grass fed, AGA grass fed. Um, but it's, it's just redundant. I see. So I, I take it it's the same thing with when you do see the label like 100% grass fed as well. <clears throat> Again, unless you see our seal or some kind of certification or some kind of on farm inspection process, it's all done by paperwork. And there's very few employees overseeing lots and lots of labels. I see. So do you know roughly what percentage in the marketplace like companies use the grass fed, grass finished, or 100% grass fed and don't really? apply those standards? We don't know exactly how many. We do know that the majority of the grass fed that's, that's in our marketplace right now, probably 85 to 90 percent of it is coming from offshore. Um, and it's, it's labeled product of the USA. And it can be because once those, those carcasses hit the United States, if it's repackaged, it can be labeled product of the USA. So you've got, you've got, a, double, you've got a double whammy here. You've got, you don't know how many uh, producers are actually doing it other than being certified by us or if it's coming from offshore where it, we don't know how it's raised. It's all done by paperwork. I see. Do you know, like, uh, I see that a lot of uh, beef is imported from like Australia or New Zealand. Do you know how the quality standards are there in no, terms of beef production practices? No, there it's, um, we, we don't really know. Um, they, they say they have some standards. They say they follow this. They sell, but again, it's all done by affidavit. It's all done by paperwork. So we're, we're a little, we don't know. Plus the fact that if they can import um, offshore beef and send it 10,000 miles and put it in our, our marketplace for less than the cost of production to U.S. producers, uh, we're probably not getting the top of the, mm. top, of the top of the line there. Yeah, that's my next question. I was noticing like uh, beef sold at like at least the supermarket near my house is like six dollars, six dollars a pound for like packaged ground beef, like grass fed beef. And I'm like, man, I wonder how they get it like so cheap like that. They have to like ship it way over here, all the costs of that. And it's still cheaper than like the ten dollar. Uh, there's like a, a company called Primal Pastures, which sells pastured beef near my house. And it's like ten dollars a pound, but it's like right across the street. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, how's it ten? ten dollars a pound there and then like six dollars a pound from way over new zealand with all those shipping costs and the fuel costs and all that yeah we, so. do, we don't we don't really know um we don't know how their farmers are being paid we don't know how what the production practices are um it's there's a lot of marketing going on and again i'm not going to disparage farmers anywhere in the world but i'm um, just uh, because i just don't know how they can do it i see well, what kind of, do you feel like that paperwork provides like enough checks and balances to be able to audit a company to make sure they're staying true to their claims? Well, having filed about 40 uh, Freedom of Information Acts in the last year, no. <laughs> so and, uh, some of the ones that come through, we're, we, we definitely know are not, are not grass-fed. And a lot of the ones that we get back are redacted so heavily that we're, it's hard to find out exactly what, where they're buying their beef, where they're processing the beef, that kind of thing. But uh, it, it, there's nothing that beats being on the ground and seeing the farm and seeing how things are raised and, and, um, and cared for and how the land's being managed and all of those things. I see. So what kind of what kind of checks and balances the does the American Grass Fed Association uh, have to make sure that the people you certify are actually applying to those principles of being one hundred like genuinely one hundred percent grass fed? 
we have a set of standards they have to the the producer has to follow um they have to be members of aga and it's a very nominal fee um, and then they have to have an on-farm inspection every 15 months um, and the reason we do it every 15 months is so we can see the farms and ranches at different times of the year um, they're on farm and then they come back and we review them if there's any discrepancies or anything like that we can go back out to the farm um, and see them again. We reserve the right to do spot inspections at any time. Um, so it's it's a checks and balance, and we 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 make sure that we get we get those things done. I see. Gotcha. Also, is it true that like a farmer, for instance, can? Uh, I know you mentioned there's a lot of flexibility in terms of grass fed labeling, but a farmer can kind of finish the cow or finish the cattle on hay or like grass pellets and still be considered uh, like 100% grass fed? Because I remember there is um, there is some beef I was buying a while ago from kind of like a small organic style uh, grocery store near my house called Sprouts. And they were selling their beef as like 100% grass fed. But then like one day I decided to call the company at, and ask them about their production practices. And they mentioned that they're just finishing their cattle with grass pellets in like a feedlot at the end. Well, is that like... Yeah, the re reason AGA producers can't do that is because if we have a we have a standard they have to meet that there's no confinement feeding. Um, that's not to say that you can't f uh, supplement animals on pasture with hay or those kind of things, but they have to be out on pasture, and that's that's critical for the animals. Animals have to be out and have to be able to be moved or, or to move. So if they're finishing them in a confinement feeding operation on hay, that's that's disingenuous to what the consumer believes when they think those animals are out on pasture. I see. Do you know if like feeding cattle those grass pellets or like hay, for instance, provides like a lower nutritional profile as compared to actually like um, roaming on pasture and eating grass? Well, it that's a real that's a real um, deep subject to get into. Uh, it has to do with the nutritional balance of what they're what they have to graze on and sometimes in order to make maintain the uh, protein and the energy levels you do have to you can supplement but it has to be forage uh, high quality forage can be a benefit but it, yeah it has to be um, fed on pasture and they have to be able to get out and get and move so it depends on the time of year with a lot of people too gotcha well, let's say like uh, like you mentioned a second ago that it's best to kind of know your farmer and see the farm on hand. Let's say like a person does want to buy from a small local producer. What are some uh, things they can like ask or look for when uh, when they do go inspect the farm just to know it's like a legit operation? Well, know your farmer, know your food. You have to know what, what you're looking for because a lot of consumers go to the farm and, and uh, they they wouldn't know the difference between one operation and the other unless they've been, uh, you know, kind of educated about what to look for. You're looking for animals on pasture, of course. You're looking at healthy pastures. You're not looking at areas that have been degraded. Um, and I'm not to say that there aren't some areas around feeding, I mean, around watering and, and, and such like that, that, that won't have uh, really good high quality forage around it. You're looking for all kinds of things. Um, it, it has to do, if you're looking at a pasture that has lots and lots and lots and lots of animals in it with a very small pasture, uh, there's probably some, there's probably some um, additional feedings going on somewhere because you can't, it has to do with stocking ratios, has to do with the health of the animal, all those things. And for the average consumer, they don't know those things. That's why we send out trained professionals out into the field to look at farms and to go through all those things with the producer. Gotcha. Well, is there like a certain kind of, um, I guess, like cattle per acre number a person should look for, like a rough ratio? or No, you, that's that has to do with the, uh, the soil health, um, the forage health, and the animals. And if, a, if the average consumer went out and saw those things, um, unless would they know how those things are all managed, then they probably wouldn't be able to tell that. Well, what's the difference between like very like uh, healthy forage versus kind of not so healthy, not so healthy forage? Can you give a description with that? Uh, it I, I, wait a minute. I don't, I don't know where what, what I don't know the what you're trying to look for. So uh, I guess 
like, what's the difference if I were to go check out a pasture and I'm like, oh, does this kind of uh, forage or grass provide like a superior nutritional profile for the cattle? Um, no. Or does no, it, it, has, not? it has to do with the soil health. It has to do with the, the soil. Everything comes from the soil. So that maintains the, the, the ability of the plant to, to um, produce good nutrition. Uh, that's where we bring in the soil scientists. That's where we bring in nutritionists, animal nutritionists, and all those things. So the average consumer could look at really beautiful, green, wonderful grass and say, hey, that looks good. And that might not have good, good, um, good energy and protein in it. So, oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, so you would have to do like actual like laboratory soil testing to know that the pasture is kind of, I guess, giving the best nutritional profile for the cattle, right? It's not like something you can just kind of visually check out well producers can because they're looking at they, they know what they're looking for so all scientists know what they're looking for the average uh, consumer if we're, if we're still on that subject probably would, <laughs> would not know how to do that well i know like i remember watching like one video on joel salton and he's describing kind of like the difference between like very short grass and very like tall mature grass is that like one way to visually see if it's uh i guess like if the cattle have like an abundance of healthy food available for them. Again, there are so many variables there that I, I would I would suggest that the consumer um, wouldn't have have the resources to do that. As far as very tall grass and very short grass, and you're talking about grazing it down and letting it grow back, and how and the great and how long the, the grass should be before it's grazed, and moving animals onto um, good pasture so that they can graze that down and then move that back out, and the soil health and the root structure and all those things, that's a science. And that's where the, the good quality producers that are, are producing good quality beef would know that. But again, that's that's something that, that you have to have people on the ground who are inspecting these farms that can see those things, that understand those things. I see, gotcha. And is there kind of like a specific like um, daily rotation uh, ratio like a person should look for like if they're rotating the cattle onto like fresh pasture daily or every other day is that a question they should ask that's a herd management decision and it depends um, can, animals can be moved daily they can be moved twice a day they can move three times a day they can be moved every other day they can be moved weekly it has to do with pasture management and herd management those are herd management decisions and a good farmer who knows his cattle and knows his land or knows his animals excuse me and knows his land will know when those things need to happen. I see, gotcha. And um, are there any questions like the consumer could ask in terms of like medicine or vaccines or like antibiotics or other drugs being used? Well, that's, if, you, if you're using antibiotics in our program, <clears throat> we believe totally that you should treat an animal who needs, who needs to be treated, but then they have to come out of the program. But if the consumer, <laughs> if the consumer goes out and, the anim, and they're using, um, antibiotics on a routine basis, then that's probably not what you're thinking of when you're thinking grass fed because good healthy animals on good healthy pasture probably don't need a lot of antibiotics. As far as vaccines, some vaccines are required by different states, different locales. Um, so vaccines are a herd management decision. A lot of our producers do not vaccinate, but some have to and some do. But again, a vaccination is different than, a, than an antibiotic. I see, gotcha. And it's kind of like the, do, the USDA kind of taking steps to implement some kind of screening process for grass fed. Because I remember reading like, um, I think a year ago, it's been a while since I kind of kept, kept up to date on this stuff, but they're kind of trying to implement some kind of grass fed labeling uh, uh, standards and claims. But then I don't know if it went through. Do you know anything about that? They have a, the USDA has a, has a uh, grass fed claim for small and very small producers, but it only has to do with live animals. It's only so the, anim the animals can be sold into the grass-fed market. And again, it's all done by affidavit. It's, it, you have to be uh, under a certain number of animals to be able to uh, apply for it and be approved for it. It's done by affidavit, but it has nothing to do with the meat on your plate. I see. Gotcha. And I know like one of the most mis, uh, like I give grocery store tours from time to time to explain like food production practices to people looking to lose weight. And a lot of times they're like, oh, but my beef is organic. It says organic on it. Can you explain kind of like the shortcomings of labeling beef organic? Because they automatically 
in their mind's eye perceive like the cattle are on pasture and they're eating a species specific diet and all that stuff. But the reality of the situation is the organic standard a lot of times doesn't even cover that. So can you kind of go a little bit into into that detail? Well, organic just means what the animal, what the what the animal has been eating is organic. Um, the organic standards do have do have an access to pasture um, component in the in the standards. It's 120 days on pet on pasture, and that sounds like a lot until you look at that's 240 days that they can be off pasture and eating organic in a confinement feeding operation. And if you look at that, 120 days is what, four months? So they've got eight months that they can be confined in feeding organic grain, whatever. Gotcha. And can you go a little bit more into detail in terms of the nutritional profile of uh, consuming an animal that was fed a species-specific diet versus like an animal that wasn't? So in this case, cattle that are fed grains mainly for kind of like at least half of their life or like a little bit shorter and then versus cattle that are just like genuinely fed 100% uh, grass? Well, the nutritional balance is, it, it has to, you have to do a lot of, you have to do a lot of, uh, excuse me, you have to do a lot of testing, uh, but um, the CLA omega-3, CLA omega-3, uh, uh, excuse me, O6 ratio in, in grass-fed is higher depending on what kind of forage they're coming off of. It's better for the animal not to have been fed a grain-fed diet because it's not something they're, they're designed to eat. Um, the, the meat itself is more fatty, and that's something that the American palate has gotten used to, but it's not a true uh, sense that the beef that's coming off of, or the uh, meat that's coming off of pasture will have a different texture profile. It'll be a little uh, beefier, we like to call it. It's the way beef is supposed to, to taste and cut. As far as nutritional, um, a, lot of, a lot of our producers do test for that. Um, we just look at the overall picture that it's better for the environment because they're not being confined to bed. They're not doing inputs of grain and they're not, uh, waste management is handled um, holistically because when the animals are spreading their own, own uh, manure and, and stuff across the pastures, it's going back into the earth in a, in a very symbiotic way. So you're not, that's not having to be trucked in and trucked out. But again, nutritional analysis on grass fed and grain fed is, uh, is not something that, that the USDA has allowed us to do yet is to make that, that distinction. So we're working on it. It's just going to be very expensive to do. So you have to, as a consumer, you just have to understand that you're, you're eating something that's been fed something that they're designed to eat. And as Michael Pollan said years ago, you are, you eat what you, what you're, what you're eating, eat eight. So, uh, you know, and ruminant animals with a, with a four chambered stomach is not designed to be fed grain. Gotcha. And also, can you kind of like touch on the myth of like, for instance, a lot of vegetarians claim like, oh, beef is like destroying or contributing to the destruction of the planet. Um, and they're basically a lot of times like they would argue like, oh, all of these Amazon fires are basically designed to set up like huge cattle operations, you know, like feedlot operations. But I keep trying to tell them like, actually, they're designed to grow like mainly like corn and soy. They're responsible for feeding like factory farmed operations and moreover for uh, basically being turned into ethanol for the most part. And can you kind of touch on, um, you kind of touched on it a little bit in the beginning, but can you kind of go over the concept that like if cattle are fed a species specific diet, they would just be living off grass, which just grows on the ground and around the area they live on anyways. And you don't need to build these huge monocropping Sowing corn, uh, sowing corn operations. Well, it, dietary choices are again choices that you make based on your value beliefs. And it's um, as far as vegetarians and vegans, that's something that you have to make. That's a choice you have to make for yourself. If you're eating a non-meat protein diet, then you also have to look at how the things that you're eating are being grown. If you're eating beans that have been grown in a third world country to feed you and those populations are starving, then I would suggest that we look at that. Um, there are areas in this world that are not designed to grow crops. Uh, they're, they're designed as pasture and, um, and prairie. So those, those uh, parts of the world 
should not be plowed up and put into row crop. They should be allowed to be maintained and hoofed animals have been for years helping maintain those, those open spaces. Um, again, those are, those are choices that you have to make, but you, if you're going to do it, you just can't say, I'm going to stop doing this because I've heard that. Um, it, a good managed um, pasture-based production system, uh, White Art Pastures is one that had a life cycle analysis done, and they are sequestering carbon. They sequester, they, uh, um, they don't have water runoff. They're, they're holding water, all of these things. It's not just white out there. A lot of them, they're doing that. So uh, I would suggest that people not say, make um, quick value judgments about things that they're not particularly schooled in. So I'm, I'm being very gentle here <laughs> because I'm, I'm a carnivore, but uh, I think that you just need to, to not make that, you know, broad sweep, sweeping statements about one particular um, uh, production system before you look into what you're eating and how that came to put, be put on your plate. And uh, if you're if you're flying in uh, fruits and vegetables from all over the world because you're not going to eat something that's grown near your home, um, just rethink that a little bit. Gotcha. And how do you feel like the beef industry is doing in terms of is the feedlot like factory farm kind of industry still kind of like expanding and or are they kind of like dying out and going more towards like small farmers that are kind of have more. I guess, like ethical production practices or more sustainable production practices. How's that marketplace doing? Well, again, um, it's we, we, uh, small um, farms are hopefully going to continue to have their place in the, in the world. Uh, we'd like to see more um, consumers buy from small family farms and small family farms are finding ways to have enough production by banding together to put their, their, their products in the marketplace. As far as how that uh, the confinement feeding operation the big feeders are doing, um, they're still they're still thriving. It's the majority of the meat in this country, and until the consumer starts demanding more and more a different type of thing, a, a different type of uh, production practice, they're going to continue. So uh, read your labels, know your farmer, know your food, all those things. But it's it's um, it's a tough nut to crack. I see. Gotcha. And do you have, before we kind of close out today, do you have like anything else to add? Any other comments you want to, you want to cover? Well, we just had a conference in, in Albuquerque. We, two, we group with two other uh, groups and, and we have a wonderful uh, conference and we, uh, we drill down on consumer and there were a lot of consumers there. And that's very, um, it's very, um, I like that because they, they're coming to the source. They're, they're talking to farmers in a setting like that. We're talking about, um, production practices and what you should be looking for. And we're talking about the big picture items. Um, so instead of reading about something, if you're close to a farmer's conference, go and, and see. As far as all of that, I'm, I'm encouraged. And I always am because our, our membership and our, our production practices are um, being emulated all over the country. We're fighting one thing we're hard we're fighting is this offshore labeling of beef that's being allowed to be labeled product USA because it's, it's disingenuous to our farmers who are trying to raise their families, keep them on the land, keep their rural economies uh, healthy, and uh, for them to have to compete with what you saw in the marketplace of three ninety nine a pound or four ninety nine a pound supposedly uh, product USA grass fed is coming from somewhere and you don't know how it's raised so. I'm hoping that we can continue to get the consumer to say, no, stop this mislabeling. And that, that goes back to consumerism and that's uh, voting with your fork. And, um, and we just keep hoping, keep, keep hoping that it happens. And, and I'm, I'm encouraged every time I see people who are not farmers by, by edu by, by generation like me, um, that just want to farm because it's something they want to do rather than something they've been born to do. And we still have us guys too. So, but uh, a lot of consumers out there are, are looking at these guys and say, keep our, keep our way of life happy and healthy and our, our economy good. So buy from American family farms. Gotcha. And really quick, touching on the policy issue I had, I chatted with uh, Joel Salatin a little bit about this and he mentioned, it's just kind of like uh, it's hard mainly for the small farmer to go mainstream because of the 
policies that the government implements kind of benefit more of the larger like factory farm type environments. It's very true. Can you kind of uh, touch a little bit onto that? Onto that yeah, that, that gets into a, an all day conversation and lots of trips to Washington. But uh, <laughs> you're like, this is what has kept me up at night for the last 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> kept me on uh, on East Coast uh, all night flights a lot of times visiting with my representatives and stuff because they don't. Um, it's very hard to have policy that supports American family farms and farmers, even though the government will admit that we are 90% of their uh, their constituency. But the big meat packers and the big producers and the big offshore folks have lots of money and they can lobby. And they, uh, as a, we need to stop that. And we need to we need to have a level playing field. And right now we don't have that. So it's gonna. It's going to be taking all of you guys to, out there, the consumers that are hearing this and the consumers that want to to uh, sign on to petitions. Uh, we did a petition for the 10,000 mile meat campaign so we could stop this. And we got we got about 2,500 uh, comments in a very short period of time. But we need 10,000. We need 20,000 comments when, when these things go out. And we need people to call call their congressman or Facebook their con or Instagram or chat, Snapchat and all those platforms to say, uh, Give these guys a fair shake. That's all we want, it's a fair shake. And can you quickly kind of describe like one or two policies that are definite examples of uh, like benefiting the factory farm model versus the small farmer? Well, the main one is the offshore labeling. We've got to stop that that immediately. That has to stop and we're working on that diligently. The other policy is the policy of processors. Small family farms cannot put their animals into the processing system that's been built that uh, is um, for the big the, for the big guys they can't they can't have the number of animals that can compete with that and when you have um, big processing facilities that process 400 animals an hour and you've got small processors being put out of business because they have to follow the same regulations as those guys but the the dynamics of an animal of a processing plant that's just doing 40 a week, having to follow the same um, restrictions and economics of scale that a large processing plant does, it just it doesn't work, and that has to be addressed. And we're working on that as well, and keeping those small processing plants open so these guys have a place to take their animals to have them processed. So, product to USA, and then um, again, know your know where your animal know where your food's coming from and how it's being processed. Gotcha. And where could uh, where could kind of a consumer go and find um, American Grass-Fed Association certified certified beef? Do you guys have that listed on your website? Yeah, it's on our website. We're we're getting ready to do some upgrading to our website, but if you can't find it, all of our, our certified producers are listed uh, on our produce on our producer page. But if you can't find it there, email us and we'll be happy to help you. Um, a lot of these folks have, have bypassed the retail market because the margins are so small and what they have to do to get into retail is is really difficult. So a lot of them are going online and selling direct. So that's a really good option with, with the way that, that um, food is being distributed in this country now. But um, there's very little um, uh, AGA certified uh, grass fed in the retail marketplace. But there is some and we can help you with that. All right, cool. Yeah, that was the other question. I, I remember looking for uh, for your guys' certification at a few stores near near where I live, and I couldn't find any. So, yep, that helps. That helps explain the reason reason behind that. So, well, if you can if you can take the the same product and sell it online and get it to the consumer uh, on a one to one basis, so you've got that relationship with your consumer, and keep the money that would go uh, to to feed your family and to keep your kids in school and all those things and and support your local you know baseball team and keep it in your rural economies rather than giving it to somebody else then that's that makes it a lot better um the other thing too is that if you want your retailer to carry um ha grass fed then ask them then tell them and we'll work with them to try and get it to make it happen but again every time that that product leaves their hands and goes to somebody else's hands to go to somebody else's hands to get on the retail shelf um that chips away at, at the money that the farmer gets and i think that there's a really good um, um, thing going around on Facebook right now is that out of every dollar spent uh, at the grocery store, the farmer gets 12 cents. 
So, uh, we yeah, need- and there's a really good book on that called like Foodopoly. Yeah, I remember I read it a while back. I forgot the author's name, but yeah, she basically breaks down the economics of like even like a box of cere- like seven dollar cereal. The farmer gets like two cents yeah. out of like that whole entire box, you know. So. Yeah, well, I, I think it's, I think that um, how food is produced is becoming more and more mainstream, and I'm really thrilled to see that. And it's not only what we're doing, but what other small family farms are doing in this country to keep keep our economy healthy. Gotcha. Okay, well, um, thank you again for taking taking your time to be a guest on the show. Um, is there is there anywhere, like if a person wants to get in contact with you, is there any kind of uh, web, like your personal website or any website or contact information if you go to the uh, americangrassfed.org website and click contact it will get to me within a day trust me i've got a really good group of people that make sure that i i get the comments or it goes to the right person who can answer your question cool well thank you thank you again Barry. by the way we also have a very active facebook page and we have instagram now we got some other things we got a twitter feed so all we're working on being uh socially responsible with social media gotcha and for the listener, I'm just going to have all those links right in the description tab to make it easy so you can just kind of click on them. Okay. So, we, okay. Really, we really appreciate the shout out. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Carrie. Okay. Have a good day.